The man who lives in this house makes very good orange marmalade. He also breeds orchids. He has never eaten a dish of tripe in his life, and he wishes that his dog could speak to him. And that eccentric sequence of autobiographical irrelevancies may even give you a clue as to who he is. He's Roald Dahl, of Norwegian and Welsh origins, and by now probably the most widely read author of children's books in the entire world. Titles like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant Peach, Danny the Champion of the World, and most recently, the BFG, the Big Friendly Giant. They're the sort of books that have brought him such a worldwide readership that he's reputed to spend 200 pounds a month on postage alone, just answering the letters from his young readers. All right, Hilary, what have we got this morning? Well, we have an enormous book here from a school in Norfolk. And a lot of pictures and letters as well. well that's super, isn't it? Dahl's books for children have made him immensely famous and rich. A children's bestseller goes on selling and on and on. And he's had several. It's his mixture of the quirky, the bizarre, and sometimes downright shocking that children love. Hello, gorgeous Anita and all the brilliant children who sent me such lovely pictures and letters. And they adore the way he takes their side in his books and letters, and the way he stirs them deliciously close to the wickedly unconventional and rude. All right, Hilary, uh, we've done the letters. Here's a bit more manuscript for you. Uh, Adult readers know Roald Dahl from his collections of short stories, many of which formed the hugely successful television series Tales of the Unexpected. Roald Dahl is 66 now, 40 years a writer, and his first publication was something of a patriotic effort. Oh, well, that was in the war, after I'd finished my RF flying and I was sent to Washington. I was sitting in the British Embassy, uh, and in a little man poked his head round the door with thick glasses and said, may I come in? And I thought he was looking for a job. And he said, my name is C.S. Forrester. Oh, indeed. And I thought, no, no, no come on, steady on. <laughs> rubbish, he's one of my heroes. He said, honestly, it is. Uh, and and uh, he came in and, and he said, uh, I've been asked to do a piece about uh, some um, action in the war, and you've just come out of the RAF and you were shot down and all that. And the Americans weren't in the war then, and we were trying to do a lot of British propaganda. And stuff. He said, come out to lunch with me and tell the, tell me the most exciting thing that happened to you. And uh, I'll write it, and it'll be published in the Saturday Evening Post, and it'll be very good for Britain. So we went to lunch, and, and uh, we were eating a roast duck, and, and, and uh, Forrester was trying to take notes and eat the duck at the same time, and he, and he couldn't, and I could see he couldn't. And, he was, and I said, look, would you like me to jot this down for you this evening, and I'll send it off, and you can put it right. And he said, oh, that would be marvelous. And so I did, and I sent it off. And a week later, uh, later I got a, a letter back from him uh, with a check for $1,000 saying, I haven't touched a word. It was wonderful, and they want more. So that's how I started. I spent the ensuing 20 years, or 25, just writing short stories for adults, nothing else. And then I began to have my own children and tell them stories in bed, the usual thing, you know. And I, I probably ran out of a plot for a short story. And I, and I was telling one to my small children in bed, and, and, and uh, there was one they seemed to rather like about a peach that got bigger and bigger as it grew on the tree. And I thought, well, by golly, why don't I have a go at writing this myself? Nothing else to do. So I sat down and had a go. I enjoyed it enormously. I found myself loving doing it, you know. And that became James and the Giant Peach? Yes. He has remained sufficiently disciplined to spend four hours each day in his writing hut at the top of the garden. I couldn't possibly work in the house, especially when there used to be a lot of children around, and even when there aren't children, there are vacuum cleaners and people bustling about. No, I always write in this little hut. I always have. It, it is absolutely quiet up here.
It may not be uh, pretty or tidy, and it certainly hasn't been cleaned and the floor hasn't been swept for five years at least. So it's full of everything. The only thing I, I, I did uh, remove about two years ago, uh, we had a goat that got in and there was some goat droppings on the floor and I thought, well, I better get a dustpan and sweep those up, and I did. I've taken a great deal of trouble with the actual chair I sit in and the place I put my feet, which is tied to the legs of the chair so I don't shove it away when I press my feet against it. Also in the winter I get into a sleeping bag and that's right up to my chest. Keep the feet warm, the legs warm. And I always use six pencils and they always have to be sharpened before I start. Finally, you get settled. You get into a sort of nest and get really comfortable. And then you're away. The pencil doesn't very often touch the paper. It's looking and musing and correcting and then, then you do a little writing. and. and uh, in the end, you get something done, but your concentration is fairly intense. You, you, you're lost. You're into this world of the story that you happen to be doing. It, it's terrifically demanding, you know. What do I write? Four, four and a half hours a day. So a quarter of my waking hours, I am completely immersed in a dotty world of fantasy and you come out, you know, in a kind of moony state. To my mind, I don't think there's any question that to write a children's book of comparable quality to a fine adult novel or story is more difficult. It's much oh. more difficult to achieve the children's book. Now, why is that? Goodness knows. I don't do you have to put yourself in their minds? Or is that the wrong way yes, to approach it? Yes, you do. You see, when you're, when you're old enough to... to to, uh, and experienced enough to, to be a competent writer uh, and you're ready to write a book for children because a young person can't do it, a child can't do it. Uh, by then you're usually, you become uh, pompous and, and uh, uh, adult, grown up and, 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 and you've lost all your jokiness. You don't have any, 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 any and, and so unless you are a kind of undeveloped, uh, adult, and you still have an enormous amount of childishness in you, and you giggle at funny stories and jokes and things, I don't think you can do it. Another of the things one hears about writing for children, and I'd love to know whether it's a myth or not, is that children are very severe critics. Well, I, I think they take the, the, the books far more seriously than adults. If you read a novel, a good, goodish novel, you read it, you enjoy it, you put it down, and that's it. And then you go look for the next one. Uh, if a children, if a child picks up a book and likes it, uh, that's not the end of it, you know. It's at least it's read at least four, five, and sometimes fifteen times, and each time it's got to stand up to that. Uh, sooner or later, some of them finish by knowing them by heart. A rural vantage point in a small home county's village hasn't restricted Dahl's vision. His wide-ranging interests from the domestic to the romantic contribute hugely to the pleasure of reading his books. His stories are like his life, full of offbeat bits of colour and knowledge. He's about as near as you'll find to a 20th century Renaissance man. I love pictures and I've always collected pictures, even when I couldn't afford to buy them. And now I have some good ones, lovely ones. I love wine and uh, have several thousand bottles in the cellar. I love furniture, especially 18th century English furniture. I love uh, cultivating plants, especially orchids. A lot of things, you know. I think nearly everyone, every sane and semi-intelligent person likes those sort of things. We have a, a good snooker table in the house and uh, we play three times a week. 
and that's played with my local friends. Sunday's a long session. I mean, we start at 6.30, four of us, uh, and we finish about 11. And uh, someone brings in some sausages in the middle. Uh, that's lovely, snooker. I mean, it is so difficult to play, you see. And, and what infuriates all of us, and I think especially me, is it, it's one thing that you cannot get really good at, however hard you try unless you are supremely gifted, born with it. <laughs> You're very successful. Why do you still write? You don't need to presumably work anymore. Oh, no, I love it. I love it, yes. I, I don't know what I'd do without having something to work and worry about uh, all day. You've been telling the children who write you that you're now 66, you're getting old and you're feeling old, and if I may say so, you're not looking old. You look yeah, as if I you're going to go on forever. <laughs> no, I feel very ancient. <laughs> when eventually you do finally have to give up or want to give up, whichever comes first. Mm. Um, when, 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 when I die. When you die. Yeah. Is there any particular way in which you want to have been remembered? Say by a child who turns into an adult? Uh, well, I, I, you can quote Oscar Wilde and say, when I am gone, I hope it will be said, my sins were scarlet, but my books were red. 